A fortnight ago, the world learnt of the shocking beheading of Khaled al-Assad in a public square in Palmyra in Syria. Palmyra is an ancient city and was home to precious 2,000-year-old ruins which UNESCO listed as a World Heritage Area of major significance. In May, the evil Islamic State organization took control of Palmyra. Part of that organization's modus operandi is to loot priceless antiquities for sale on the black market and then destroy ancient sites, especially temples of other faiths. Al-Assad was an archaeologist and retired chief of antiquities for Palmyra. And he was apparently tortured and murdered in an effort to extract the location of some of the city's hidden treasures. Since the death of the lion guarding Palmyra, as historian Tom Holland described him, that city has seen the bulldozing of the ancient temple of Baal Shamin. Nearby the ancient Roman amphitheatre where IS executed 25 prisoners on YouTube last July. Meanwhile, news also emerged of the desecration and then complete obliteration of Ma Elian St. Julian Monastery, not far from Palmyra. It was from this monastery that the Syrian Catholic priest, Jacques Murad, who had been instrumental in working for improved relations between Muslims and Christians, was kidnapped earlier this year. As a result of such terror, we see hundreds of thousands of Christian, Muslim and other refugees fleeing from that region, joining the biggest mass movement of people in Europe since the Second World War. What we are witnessing is not just a mass migration, but as Pope Francis reminded us at last Sunday's Angelus, the worst persecution of Christians in all of history. Worse even than that under the maddened Roman emperors. It's estimated that over 100,000 Christians are martyred every year. 11 or so killed for their faith every hour. 11 new martyrs before this Mass is over. Again and again, Pope Francis pleads for the international community to respond. But the world looks on paralyzed or looks away. Looks away from that wanton destruction of innocent human life and cultural patrimony. Any murder, any genocide appalls us. But as our Prime Minister recently pointed out, there is something even more wicked going on right now. Even the Nazis had the decency to try to cover up their evil deeds. Whereas these villains proudly parade them on the internet for all the world to see. But what are we to do about it? Even with the wisdom of Solomon, we'd be hard pressed to know what will actually help in this situation by way of military, diplomatic or humanitarian intervention. And so we might well ask, 
Why isn't God doing something about it? Our first and second readings today remind us that the Christian religion is one infused with the hope that in the end, God turns everything to the good. Isaiah exhorts the faint-hearted to have courage. The God of justice will vindicate the, the victims in the end, make fruitful what had been rendered sterile desert, bring goodness even out of great evil. Christians know that God sometimes does this in ways we would not at first have preferred. Indeed, in ways we could hardly imagine. Isaiah glimpsed that salvation would come through a baby born of a maiden, a suffering servant who would endure sin rather than commit it. But he had little idea what this would really mean. The incarnation of the Christ child to a maiden who would proclaim in her Magnificat that it was precisely for the lowly. The preaching of that child grown adult proclaiming the poor and humble, the persecuted and grieving as the most blessed in his new kingdom. The passion, death and resurrection of that baby grown adult and now turned sacrifice. Once again, for the sake of the most forsaken, including one tortured beside him on a cross to whom he promised paradise. In such a topsy-turvy way, God plants his kingdom of justice and mercy in humble and contrite hearts and gives us cause to hope for that kingdom come when time is at last fulfilled. Our gospel story today of Jesus healing a deaf man takes place in the Decapolis region, that is, not far from Palmyra. A deaf and dumb man is brought to him and healed by him, and so astonished are all that see it that the silence he asked for seems impossible. Jesus, the healing compassion of God made flesh, reaches out to touch those at the most far-flung, most abandoned margins of civilization near, near Palmyra. And his retribution is not violent, but healing. Defeating his enemies by making them his friends. God is glorified not just in the wonders of his Son, but in the actions of those selfless men and women inspired by him. The Holy Father's recent remarks about Christian persecution were provoked by the story of the Syriac Catholic bishop, Flavianus Michael Meiki, who was recently beatified along with a Chaldean bishop, killed exactly one century ago when another persecution was raging in the Middle East, all to alike the one in Syria today. As today the secular world celebrates Father's Day, we might consider the spiritual paternity of great leaders like those bishops, priests and monks who have given their lives for their faith and their people. In a culture that often depicts men as helpless buffoons 
and now openly doubts whether we need both a man and a woman to make a family and give children the best start. Spiritual fathers, like the still missing Father Jacques Murad and the now blessed Flaviana Smelki, underline the indispensable contribution men can make not just to being breadwinners for the next generation, but spiritual fathers to their children by teaching them to worship and pray, to value gentleness and tolerance and all the virtues we need if our world is to be better than it is proving to be right now. Bishop Melky like a good father bishop, died defending the patrimony of his faith. Al-Assad died defending the patrimony of Palmyra and of all mankind. Our word patrimony, of course, is from the Latin word pater, father. It refers to what our fathers have protected and left to us, bequeathed and handed down to us. Fathers must be ever attentive to that, to what it is they leave behind for their children and their children's children and all their generation. The guarding and transmission of that patrimony may not mean their early death, but it will require of biological fathers, as well as of clerics and unmarried laymen in the world, daily acts of self-denial and generosity for the sake of the young people coming after us. For such fatherhood, all kinds of fathers, spiritual and material, should be applauded and supported. God bless all fathers. <laughs>